Good afternoon to everyone for uh, the second part of our inaugural conference. Uh, my name is uh, Ulrich Hege. I'm a professor of finance here and as such also associated with the Center uh, for Sustainable Finance, Sustainable Finance Center that we are inaugurating. And it's a huge honor to uh, chair this panel in view of the distinguished panelists. Our panel, before I introduce them, uh, what is it, the panel about? It's a panel on green investments. How can investors and capital flows directed towards socially responsible investments, energy efficiency, and alternative um, energies, the challenges faced by asset managers and regulators in the coming age of energy transition. So it's a heavy focus on energy transition. This is also in everybody's, mi everybody's mind. Uh, this is just the days of the COP25, four years after the Paris Accord, uh, the COP21. So, and it's, it's a topic that, of course, is increasingly taking uh, its uh, right place in the public content. So we are talking about this topic from the point of view of uh, the financial sector of capital markets and the role that uh, private capital and capital markets play in this transition. Uh, our distinguished panelists, let me introduce them, and uh, this is a panel of the future, not only because the topic that we are discussing is the topic uh, of, uh, that decides on the future we will live in, but also because this is a panel uh, of a very low carbon footprint, uh, because of an exogenous shock that we are uh, doing today. And we also see that sort of like technology as this morning in the keynote lecture by Marianne Bertrand is helping to overcome and to, to actually see how the future will be in a low carbon environment. Uh, so our panelists, to start with Diana Philip, who is to my right, who is from Bailey Gifford, investment manager based in Edinburgh, Scotland, and a partner and a, a valued partner of the fin Sustainable Finance Center, uh, I, I don't, a large asset manager, but I, uh, Diana, I'm sure you will say more about what you're doing and especially what you're doing in the arena of sustainable finance because that's precisely also what's brought you in contact with TSC that you saw that here there is interesting work being done on that topic. Then we have Laurent Claire joining us from with video conference and uh, a special thanks to Laurent and, uh, and also third person, uh, Frédéric Samama. Uh, Laurent actually made it to the airport yesterday in Orly only to learn there that he couldn't fly to Toulouse. So he's back in his office uh, at the Banque de France. And Laurent Claire is the director for research and risk analysis at uh, the APCR, the French um, Prudential Supervision and Resolution Authority, which is affiliated to the Banque de France. Before that, he was the director for financial stability at the Banque de France, also had stints at a number of other central banks, the ECB, the Bank of England. Uh, so, uh, and Laurent will be there to talk to us uh, also about the role of uh, the regulators and of the central banks, which is uh, much in discussion uh, these days. And then we have uh, Frederic Samama from Amundi. Uh, Frederic is the global deputy head of institutional and sovereign clients uh, with Amundi. He is basically with uh, first Credit Agricole and then Amundi, but as you know, Credit Agricole is one of the founders, uh, the two founders of, of Amundi for 20 years, if I can say that. And uh, Frederic is uh, also a thinker on a, the topic of green investments. He has published work with um, Patrick Bolton, with Joseph Stiglitz in this area on questions like how can you construct portfolios that reflect green investments, that de-emphasize energy intensive investments, what's the performance there, how can you minimize tracking, but I think Frederick, you will talk to us about this. So this is a very exciting panel. So we are down to three persons, but this is, this is you know, uh, given the disturbance today is, is a very good achievement and we will see how it goes. So it's definitely for any intervention from the floor, we need to have the micros uh, so that uh, Laurent Clerc and uh, Frederick Samama can understand what you're asking. And we have also the channels that uh, we don't see 
everyone each other so we don't see um, Laurent and, and Frederic. So uh, given all that, a, so we would uh, we would just then go um, to a, the first round of introductory statements, right? So a, it's about, of course, the role of private capital in energy transition, but let me say we are not wanting to limit it that, right? There are many challenges, a, a biodiversity, pollution of oceans, and many others that are certainly as severe as climate change. It's just that climate change is right now in front of the agenda and that many actors in capital markets, private and public actors in capital markets, take up the challenge, are thinking about what to do, that what makes this uh, a, a very interesting panel discussion today, right? And it's in the background that there has been going on a lot of private investment already, right? Sort of like many countries have increased the part of uh, renewable energies uh, uh, in electricity production, like some of our neighboring countries, from less to 10 to 30, 40 percent in the space of 15 years. France has a very like a, a sustainable energy mix, uh, and a but if you look at this in the global level, it's just all counting to very little, right? If you look at the um, World Energy Outlook of the International Energy Agency that came out a month before, that is just a very depressing reading because it says carbon emissions will, on current trends, only peak in 2040, and that includes that is the stated policy scenario, right? Where they don't not only take into account current trends, but sort of like the stated policy uh, commitments of governments, including those of the Paris Accord, still it would only peak in 2040. So we are not bound on a trajectory to a 1.5 uh, climate change goal, but we are on a trajectory that would as much lead much higher than that. So that is the background of the urgency of the topic. And uh, let me then just begin uh, with uh, Diana and uh, Daniel Philip, and uh, so I, I think you know you're in a firm that is very much in this area, and you're working with clients that are very much uh, you know I, um, into these topics. The first question is you know what about when you suggest green investments, and what type of green investments to them? I, I, is there a, um, a concern, a legitimate concern that? you have to sacrifice some performance there. And are they willing to accept that? How is generally the issues uh, uh, that asset managers face when trying to invest into the energy transition? Great. Diana? Thank you very much, Uli. And first of all, may I just say that it is a real pleasure to be here today. I was last in Toulouse as a young teenager um, on an exchange program, and I had the most wonderful two weeks. But I haven't been back since, and I am really thrilled to be here in this beautiful town. I'd also like to say that we're incredibly honored to be part of this really exciting and important program. At Bailey Gifford, we really prioritize founding really strong relationships with academia. We think that we'll be better investors and we'll learn a lot more from forging partnerships with the likes of the Toulouse School of Economics than we will be from listening to the short-term noise of investment bank research. There's a few issues that I hope we'll be able to touch on today and a few messages that I hope I'll be able to convey this afternoon. The first is very much about the nature of fiduciary duty and how the task of investment is defined. We think this needs to change. The second is a little bit about how we invest at Bailey Gifford and the need for people to be actual informed investors in growth businesses with uncertain outcomes rather than just traders of bits of paper. And finally, that a lot of this is new. Um, but we are very much committed, and we feel we must be committed as a large investor to being part of the discussion and learning from people who are experts. So in terms of these issues, um, we see this predominantly through the lens of being a large equity investor. And we think that there's several issues to bear in mind when thinking about the transition to um, to green energy. 
The first is very much that it is our task to generate good investment returns for our clients. There's increasingly a big and open question about whether or not um, mandates extend to thinking about societal outcomes in a broader way. But at the core of our task at Bailey Gifford, as it's defined today, is very much our need to generate financial returns for our clients and their beneficiaries. So being able to pay their pensions, etc. So the first issue that I'd cite with this is, at least in the way that we tend to invest, is that companies that are part of this energy transition really need to be able to earn attractive returns on capital. They need to have the potential to be good businesses. But then underlying that, there's a real debate that's needed, and it's occurring about exactly, exactly what that fiduciary responsibility should actually mean. This le then leads me on to my second point, which is about the regulatory regime. And this is the regulatory regime around the new energies. We think that this needs to be relatively stable and predictable. That's, of course, particularly true if you're thinking about fixed income and infrastructure investments. But it's much less true for us when we're investing in growth companies. There's also a flip side about a stable regulatory regime. And that's that we need to find a way of making traditional energy companies and their customers recognize the full cost of their products. That's not easy, and you'll feel this very acutely, particularly in France, as you've seen with the protests of the likes of the Gilets Jaunes, amongst others. But until we're properly recognizing the cost of a hydrocarbon-based economy through carbon prices and any other measures, the playing field just isn't level. And then my fourth and final point on this is much more specific to how we invest at Bailey Gifford and the types of companies that we choose to invest in for our clients. We think that one of the tragedies of modern finance is that so-called investors now overwhelmingly see their task simply as buying and selling bits of paper on stock exchanges rather than really investing in productive enterprises which may have uncertain outcomes. We think that the investment industry as a whole really needs to return to our roots. And we think that the energy transition is the foremost field for us to be able to do so. This means being courageous it means being willing to invest in companies where the chances of success may be low, um, but the returns to that success, if it comes, could be very high. It means, therefore, backing management teams who will take risks, and for us as investors to really support them along that trajectory. It also means really encouraging those companies to ignore the short-term noise of the market. And that's something that we feel as Bailey Gifford, as a long-term investor, we can really offer as supportive long-term shareholders. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Diana, for this um, uh, introduction. Mm -hmm. And I, let me then pass on I, to Frederick Samama, and uh, who is online and hope is uh, a, a listening, I, um, I can understand us. So the question is, look, there has been a change, clearly. There has been a change that investors are paying much more uh, attention to whether their money is investing invested in the green assets or brown assets or something between olive assets, as they've been called sometimes. Uh, so how would you explain that a, the, the recent investor mobilization on climate change. A, and a, 
a, what kind of innovation in the financial sectors have helped to bring about a change and are, are shifting the market? And are, where are we going in this change in investor engagement with the energy transition? Uh, uh, thank you, and uh, I apologize not to um, to be with you. Uh, just by looking through the window, I can tell you that the weather is terrible in Paris, and so uh, I can tell you that it would have been much more enjoyable to be uh, in Toulouse uh, with you. Uh, that said, we can uh, we can say clearly that we observe around the planet a major shift among the uh, asset owners. And that's a kind of revolution. And that's a very recent one. Because if we take one step back, we can say that climate change has been on the radar screen of governments and NGOs since the beginning. It means for decades. But uh, investors were not part of that picture. And over the past three to five years, so a very short period of time, compared to the fact that the topic has been on the table for decades. So very recently, asset owners have decided to jump in. And if we, can, if we take a step back and we ask ourselves why, we can see uh, many different reasons. The first one is <coughs> that over the past three to five years, the deniers have disappeared. They were still around five years ago, now they are not. Another point that has changed the entire landscape is the COP21. We have to, rem to remind ourselves that the hope of a success at the COP21 or at any COPs was very low. France was the only country to raise its hand to ask for the COP21. And until the very last minute, uh, there was a big risk of failure. The third reason is that we thought three, five years ago that China would ever block. Now China is leaning. Three, five years ago, there was almost no regulation on climate change. Now it's booming everywhere. We have now a, a cap and trade mechanism in China. Uh, now the ETS program in Europe is working. It was lagging at three, five euros, and now it has been fixed, and it's about 25 euros per town and the European Commission wants to bring it to the next level, to 45, 55. Three, five years ago, the cost of renewable energy was very high. Now it's becoming much more competitive, especially compared to coal in many countries. Three, five years ago, it was a topic only for some economists. Now you can see the, uh, um, the level of um, involvement of populations all over the planet, especially with millennials who are not going to school due to climate change. Three, five years ago, only a few investors were paying attention to it. And now, to illustrate my point, you have 330 investors representing $33 trillion, $33 trillion, having decided to engage with the 100 most polluting companies. So what I'm trying to say here is that suddenly the investors are part of that total shift of situation where none of these single forces will be enough to get a change, but when they are all aligned, then you have a tipping point, and that's really what we observe. Without mentioning the roles of central banks, but I'm sure that Laurent will speak about that, but that's the final touch that we have observed around the, uh, since the, the past six months. So really, investors are part of that shift, and the amounts of money at work are massive. My second point is to say that some, some new technologies are being developed. Um, I could refer to two of them, uh, a knife CDL, and I will start and stop there maybe with the low carbon indexes. Here you have an example of an innovation, a financial innovation that has helped investors align their portfolios with the low carbon economy. Back in 2011, one of them, AP4, challenged Amundi to find a scalable, low-cost, easy-to-implement um, solution. And we, we really looked around, and we didn't find anything that was working. 
um, the green ETFs, they had underperformed massively. The private equity funds, they were not especially cheap, not scalable as well. So we brainstormed and we said, okay, we have to develop, to develop a new technology. And then when we uh, looked at what the investor had in his portfolios, we understood that the uh, 4 had a lot of passive products, like all of its peers around the planet. And then we came to the conclusion that what we could do is to analyze the constituents of the index. We could say, let's say MSCI, we could analyze each of the single constituents in terms of carbon footprint and exposure to solid assets. And what we could do is that sector per sector, we could extract some of the most polluting companies and replace them with some of the peers that are better positioned. We take the auto car maker industry, we compare Renault, Peugeot, Toyota, Volkswagen, and so on, and we take out the most exposed companies and replace with their peers better positioned. But the beauty of the technology is that we could do that with a low tracking error, meaning that we could create, a, we could reduce the risks without changing the market exposure. It's slightly like Diet Coke. You take the sugar out, you replace with aspartame, but at the, at the end, you have the same taste for Coke. And so, more seriously, what you could have is that if you have the, the, the parent index, you can switch to the low carbon version. It's built in a way that it will track the parent index for years until polluting companies are getting penalized. And then, eventually, if you have excluded some of them, you will outperform. Basically, it creates a free option on a mispriced asset. And also, we were ready to, uh, to lose some money because it was a prototype. So it was not supposed to work immediately. Uh, we were OK you know, to try, test, and adapt. Very surprisingly, we observed that this technology on MSCI that works everywhere generated about 30 basis points of outperformance per year since 2010. To put this figure of 30 basis points in perspective, my um, 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 uh, um, um, a passive team, when, when they generate two or three bips, they say that they're the world leaders. So here we talk about 30 basis points versus two or three bips that usually a passive team can generate. That's massive. So we, we, we show here that the belief of being green is actually sacrificing returns is wrong. That's the other way around. And the rationale behind is pretty clear. We had a risk that was not priced. You know, five years ago, you were an auto car maker, a utility company, or an oil company. The risk associated with your, with your activities was just not priced by short-term oriented capital markets. So as these risks are now spreading in terms of understanding, they change the asset valuations, and we benefit from that. Just to conclude, from the policymaker's perspective, the beauty of this technology is that we don't extract the companies forever. We reassess the situation year after year. It means that if a company has been excluded because it was bad compared to its peers, but if they have made some efforts, changed their policies, they can be back within the group of selected stocks. So it means that we are creating a form of competition within each sector to accelerate the transition towards a low carbon economy. And really to conclude, uh, this technology has now spread around the planet, uh, as mentioned by the Harvard Business Review of May, June of this year. They refer to, uh, um, to one of, of, of the papers that we published with Patrick Bolton and Matt Sanderson, the CEO of AP4. And they made the point that now this technology developed in Europe between Sweden and France is now being adapted, adopted by Calsters, New York Common Retirement Fund, GPIF, New Zealand Superannuation Fund, 
and it's a 50 billion dollar technology. So Europe should be very proud of having uh, put on the table a technology that first works and second is being adopted all around the planet. Okay, thank you, Frederic. So, oh, you want? It? Okay, um, thank you. Since I, I did that didn't don't see you, I, I um, took the pause as um, as the end. Anyway, there's 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 time. Thank you for this. Uh, you know, a also upbeat statement of of what asset managers can do and how they can succeed. And uh, we heard a, also an upbeat message from from Diana before this, where the point of views of two uh, people involved in long time with uh, private asset managers. And let's turn now to our um, third a uh, panelist, uh, Laurent Claire. But we thought we would have uh, Luisa Flores here as well, but she had to, she couldn't come in the end, so it would have been another. Uh, asset managers, and uh, so let's then turn to to Laurent Claire um, with Banque de France and and the regulator. Laurent is also at the at the forefront of the thinking um, at the Banque de France and and other central banks about what they should do. Right? They have they've created a club, and perhaps you're talking about that club, the NGFS, a little bit and the thinking there. But there have been you know quite a few developments in recent uh, weeks that at least you know made it clear that central banks can no longer just sit aside and say this doesn't concern us, even if there is some dissenters like the Bundesbank uh, uh, who would say we, we're not convinced, but uh, I just you know a few headlines from uh, recent weeks. The Bank of Sweden, uh, who has decided to disinvest, right? they decided they, they took a very cautious approach, they did, it did disinvest bonds from Alberta, the Canadian province, and from West Australia, uh, the coal province, right, the, the, those provinces identified with very dirty um, extraction of sand oils and of coal uh, to, take, to make a statement, right? So this might happen that central banks would actually disinvest uh, very brown assets. We have the European investment banks that is just making noises and probably adopting it that they will no longer finance any investment in natural gas networks or anything in natural gas being this a, a, an energy um, you know, based on hydrocarbons. And uh, there's the EU Commission, uh, and that's very close to home, uh, Laurent, for you, uh, saying that we, they are thinking about differentiating capital standards, basically including some green supporting factor for green investments that would basically make the, the financing easier for banks and some reactions from the banking industry which are not oh, totally convinced. So that's to set the stage. Laurent, I'm sure you have a lot to say about the question what's the role of governments, of supervisors, of financial regulators and central banks of course in that context um, should, they, should have public institutions, the central banks with a huge asset base but also public investment banks like the Cassie Depot and others or any other public institutions, they have a role to play to favor green assets over brown and olive assets. Laurent? Uh, bonjour Toulouse. Uh, yes, yes we hear you very well. Yeah. Okay, so Okay, so thanks a lot for uh, having me on your panel today, even though I'm still in Paris. Uh, so you, you refer to the, the NGFS, which uh, stands for Network for Greening the Financial System. So it's a group of uh, central bank and regulators uh, that was launched a couple of years ago. Uh, this group was initiated by the Banque de France and, uh, and now gather uh, like uh, more than 50 uh, central bank and regulators. So the focus of this group is uh, threefold. Th there is a, a, a group working on regulatory issues, another one on uh, macro financial li linkages, and the last one on uh, central bank policy. To refer to the, the beginning of the discussion, I think that the starting point of this uh, group was the, the fact that uh, for us, uh, climate change risk was not uh, adequately and priced in uh, financial asset prices. And for that reason, uh, there was a, a form of a misallocation of uh, capital. And eventually, when you refer to the point uh, of whether investors were sacrificing performance, it is fair that uh, from the, the standpoint uh, that the risk is uh, uh, mispriced, then there is a misallocation uh, 
of capital with with respect. So we are still thinking that uh, this is still the case regarding the slow developments uh, in the financial industry. So I take uh, Frederic and then Dana's nice point that there have been uh, an increasing uh, focus on that. I think there is a shift in demand. Uh, I agree with Frederic, uh, especially from cons customers and investors, which are looking for more sustainable and responsible uh, investment. And there is also a shift and more pressure from uh, regulators and supervisors. Um, so far, the issue is uh, we are dealing with is uh, with respect to how to integrate this kind of risk. So there are different uh, avenues. The first is to improve the governance of risk uh, within financial institutions. Uh, the idea is also to try to develop uh, stress testing uh, approaches to uh, take into account financial risk. Another one is uh, also to improve the governance of risk. So we are working uh, currently on these uh, different issues. And with respect to, uh, to governance, there is also uh, this idea of uh, incentives. So Ulrich, you, you refer to this idea put forward by the industry and now uh, taken on board by the European Commission to uh, introduce a green supporting factor. So within the, the world of central bank and supervisors, there is still a, a debate since uh, some of us are convinced, the others are not with respect to the to the role that it should play. Um, there is, I think, two concerns. The first is that green is not necessarily well defined at this stage. So there have been a lot of uh, effort, uh, in particular uh, in Europe, to develop a green taxonomy. So it, it remains to be uh, put on, on action, I would say. And second, uh, there is still uh, the, the case is not made that uh, green assets are less risky than uh, brown assets. So this is something that we are investigating in the context of our work. work. A last point uh, is referring to central bank policy. So here again, there is a lot of debate. Uh, the NGFS published in, uh, in October a, a a report which is based on the, the portfolio management of central banks, and it is referring to what you said about the, the Swedish central banks. I think that uh, central banks like the Bank de France uh, now are more uh, concerned about uh, their, the investment of their own funds, so they are also applying uh, the principle for responsible investment. And there are still a lot of debate as to whether monetary policy should take green assets into account. Uh, the position of the, the French governor is to say that uh, there, there is a scope in particular to factor in this uh, consideration with respect to the collateral policy. That is the, the kind of asset that you, you, you take uh, on board when you are lending money to, uh, to, to banks. And these are the main avenues, and I will stop there. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Laurent. Thank you to everyone for uh, this uh, insightful uh, opening statements. And I mean, there, there is, there's many questions, and I'm uh, sure people from the floor want to react. I see already hands that are going up. So uh, we will have to distribute uh, the mics. Uh, uh, Sophie, are you doing it? There's a question up here in the middle over to the left and uh, of course our panelists will probably also like you know discuss again on issues that have been brought up and uh, or to new questions that we haven't brought up yet please okay so um <coughs> i think everybody's pretty much aligned on what the goals are the united nations has 17 sustainable uh, development goals and and, and everybody's agreed on that the question is how is this going to be financed? And I don't know whether there is a number yet on if you want to succeed, it's going to cost this much investment every year for the next 10 years or something. If anybody knows that number, please let me know. Let's suppose it was a trillion a year. Uh, how much can private investors take uh, the, of that? And how much should be in the, in, in, in the, the remit of central banks, the European Central Bank, 
managed to produce 2.5 trillion in three years, probably do the whole thing if it wanted to. Um, so I don't know, um, uh, does anybody have any numbers and what, what responsibility relative for private investment and public money? Question is not directed to anyone specifically who wants to answer or to react. So maybe I can, uh, this is Laurent. So there have been uh, a lot of uh, estimates about the need of, for transition. So uh, my recollection, well, there are different numbers, but it's, it's really uh, in terms of uh, thousands of uh, billions uh, of uh, euros for ensuring the transition. So about something like uh, 100 billion uh, euro per year to, to reach that. So, and perhaps even more, so uh, quite, quite a lot of money. Whether uh, investment can make it, yes, sure. So uh, Frédéric alluded to uh, new investment tools. There have been also a, a huge increase in, uh, in the issuance of green bonds, in particular by governments. So that is uh, something that is ongoing. Uh, public institutions like uh, you mentioned, I think the European Bank, uh, of investment are also uh, providing a lot of uh, financing with respect to that. So I think we are on the way, even if uh, there is still a lot to do. Uh, whether central bank can uh, finance uh, transition is also a matter of debate. Uh, I think we are not uh, yet there. So uh, perhaps uh, it's too early to say that there will be a, a green uh, QE. Uh, but at least uh, there, there is something going on uh, with respect to uh, financial markets. And, and, and to follow up on, on what uh, Laurent just said, uh, I, I would like to share with you uh, uh, an experiment um, that we, uh, we did uh, two years ago with IFC. Uh, so the World Bank's um, uh, subsidiary. Uh, they were looking for a, a partner to tackle a very well-known uh, challenge, uh, the financing of green infrastructures in emerging markets. We all know that we will win the battle of climate change if all countries are getting the right financing, not only the uh, developed countries. We know as well that we are facing a, a wrong um, allocation of capital. We have massive pools of assets in developed markets facing uh, the low or even negative yield environment. And we know that we have these needs of green infrastructures financing in emerging markets. And we know that we don't have a bridge that is costly for both parties. The developed markets don't have the returns associated with the uh, developing markets and the developing markets don't have access to the, um, to the pools of assets in developed markets. So it's a lose-lose situation. And so two years ago, uh, IFC decided to tackle this problem and so looked for a partner for that. And after a search among 17 asset managers, the leading European one was selected. And it says about the leadership of finance, green finance in Europe. And now in order to tackle the problem, actually we analyzed very precisely, very in a very pragmatic, low-key approach, the obstacles that the investors were still facing. Why is that not working? And, and there were two clear conclusions. The first one is that, even if it sounds surprising, but for many investors in developed markets, they consider that to invest into developing markets is too risky. You know, the guidelines have been established years ago and it's too risky to invest in, in Mexico and so on and so on. And the second problem is the lack of knowledge on infrastructures. Truth is that almost all investors are investing into equities, fixed income and so on, but almost none of them are investing into infrastructures because they don't know. They don't know locally. If they don't know locally, it doesn't make any sense to, to ask them to invest into Mexico, Turkey, or Korea. So based on these two problems, we designed with IFC a new solution. 
we said what we can do is to create a fund that actually will benefit from a risk sharing mechanism, meaning it will be a tranched fund, and the, the most exposed part of the fund will go into the hands of IFC that will get remunerated for that. But so we will lower the risk of the investors, or we will have a kind of treated enhancements mechanism. So problem one, tackled. Then we still have a problem two, the lack of knowledge on infrastructures. And here, and IFC deserves the credit for that, they had a moment of genius. They said, what about having local banks in Mexico, Turkey, China, and so on, issue some green bonds? We, you, the investors, you know about banks. You're comfortable with that. And if banks are issuing a green bond, they will take the commitments to channel the money towards some green infrastructure projects. So we are decoupling the risks that the investors are taking from the channeling of the money towards the green infrastructure projects. And suddenly with one deal, we were able to transfer and to deploy $2 billion from European pension funds towards green infrastructure projects in emerging market. And this deal has even received a lot of recognition. We have already received six awards for that. Um, and even President Macron referred to it in one of his speeches. And with Xavier Muscat, so the former uh, uh, chief of staff of Nicolas Sarkozy and former head of the French Treasury, we wrote a paper and a report presented to the G20. Why? Because this deal is even more than a deal. It's a new business model for the developing banks. For decades, developing banks were using their balance sheets to finance some projects, and they were uh, issuing some bonds to finance it, and as they want to keep that AAA, actually, they were financing only very safe projects. And we know that this business model is reaching its limits. But here, suddenly you have a developing bank that says, no, I will use my resources not to finance a project, but I will use my resources to unlock the investor's capabilities by assessing the missing uh, or the gaps and, and filling the gaps. And then suddenly the investors will do the jobs that otherwise I would have done. So it's really a kind of revolution among the, uh, the revenue banks. And we have announced recently that we, we have closed a very similar deal with uh, AIB. So we are financing some uh, the real green economy in Europe uh, with uh, uh, investing into green ABS, green loans, and green high yield. And very similarly as well, we announced a 500 million deal with AIB the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that on a very similar uh, business model wants that some investors are financing the green champions in Asia. So really to, to conclude on my point, is it's another example of, of green financial innovation. Here it's about the financing of the green infrastructures. And very similarly to the point one, it's by analyzing the real obstacles and using different uh, financial uh, tools that we can develop a solution that suddenly reallocates the capital differently for the benefit of the investors and society. Thank you. I'm looking. Hey, Diana, you want to? I was just going to make a, a quick point on the SDG because our experience is more linked to how we use the SDGs to help. So it's sustainable development goals of the UN. Exactly. Right? exactly. Sorry for the... Um, the ODD in French. Exactly. Um, so it's more linked to how we use them as a framework to help measure the impact of the investments that we're making for our clients. And our clients are finding these very helpful because it's providing some sort of framework to measure this. At Bailey Gifford, we've been around for over 100 years we know how to measure financial returns, but we, and like many others, are now learning how to measure the impact of our investments. And the SDGs are very helpful in that regard. One comment I would make about them is that when we're analyzing our companies and when we're using the SDGs, we have to be very careful 
particularly about the disclosures that companies are making. We have seen evidence of some companies, for example, a very well-known tobacco company, now measuring themselves to the SDGs, in particularly the SDG about healthcare and quality of life, simply because they are reducing the amount of tobacco sales that they have whilst, whilst increasing the number of vapes that they sell. We're not quite sure that that really um, applies to that SDG. So they are very helpful for us as a tool and a framework, but I would um, say that we use them with a level of caution. Okay, thank you. I'm looking for more questions from the audience. A, um, this is a, not the case. Let me then jump in with uh, one reaction to a, what um, Frederick was saying, what you, I mean, you're talking about developing uh, countries and a, a, what is there, right? but you're also referring to developing banks, right? public banks, a, which play a large role there, but I think, but I, I saw some numbers that about half of the energy transition these days is actually done by public banks of uh, one way or another, or actually bankrolled by them. So does this say something about that the role of the private uh, partners are, is actually limited? And that also brings me back to, to uh, what Laurent was saying. Right? Isn't, I mean, the, the private, the mobilization of private capital that we have seen was always conditioned on public policies. Right? We had this huge investment in the renewables because it was basically supported by feed-in tariffs for solar and wind power. Uh, can this be done without that? Uh, I mean, and uh, what is the public policies that you as asset managers, for example, would see a most important that you find actually the investment that, that, you know, that could mobilize capital? Um, so but, but is, 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 what is, can the, to what extent can the private, is the private sector here dependent on, on public policies, public guidance? Uh, for example, when, you when we look at developing countries where much of the investment is really done with the help of public development banks. The, the, like the IFC that you remember as a multinational, but also local development banks. Well, is that the question for me? Yeah, for and also Diana and also Laurent. Okay. But uh, I, I think there is a before and after COP. I, I, there are many ways to answer your question. I think uh, in general, are the asset owners and asset managers asking for something or are they already taking action without uh, a request in general and then you have a question about uh, financing some infrastructures I think there are two different topics here um, we can say um, um, I, ca I can share with you an anecdote uh, in 2014 uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon was hosting a major conference in New York in order to prepare uh, the COP21 in order to help the French government and then there was a call for project among the asset managers. And, and there were two competing uh, deals, uh, offers, one led by BlackRock and one led by us. The one led by BlackRock was, we, the asset managers, will move when there will be a price on carbon. And they had many signatories and so on. So they were clearly on the camp, in the camp of if governments are serious, then we will take action. And actually with AP4 again and CDP and, um, and UNFFI, we, we, we were putting another project on the table where we were seeing some investors around the planet are actually anticipating the fact that some regulation will come one way or the other one, and by anticipating, they're already okay to shift their portfolios. And that coalition won the deal, or the, and, and we had to, uh, to come to the COP21 with commitments from investors for $100 billion of shifts of portfolios. That was huge. And the project was then selected by Laurent Fabius and his team at the action at the, uh, at the action day during the COP21, that was the window uh, for the private sector. And that day, we announced that we didn't reach the goal of 100 billion. We reached $600 billion before the COP21. So it was meaning that investors were actually anticipating 
various forms of regulations or pressure from consumers and so on, and they were already taking action. And, and I think it was, uh, and Laurent Fabius was very happy to promote this project because it was a very important signal given to the uh, tent, to the negotiators. He could say to the negotiators, you know what? The private sector, in a certain sense, is anticipating your success. And then we have a virtuous circle because we send that signal very little, but it helped. And by su being successful, the COP21, it validated the anticipation of success of the policymakers. So what I'm saying here is that very often we think in terms of phase one, phase two, phase three, but actually by anticipating that's a job of investors, we can have the process and then it's good for society. For the infrastructures, it's slightly different because here you need to have, you know, very uh, clear rules of the games of, and, and very often the governments are changing the rules and so it creates some instability for the uh, interest investments into infrastructures and doesn't help the overall market. That's one of the obstacles, clearly. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah perfectly. Thank you. Um, okay. Any reaction okay. from the floor? There's some... Milo. Hi. Uh, so um, a question based on, on, uh, on this uh, anecdote and also on the uh, first example you have uh, you have uh, uh, shown uh, you have uh, talked about Frederick, which uh, sort of speaks to the role of a large asset manager into being leader uh, both towards regulation and towards the industry. Uh, and yet you had a sense of uh, finding solutions which are scalable. So maybe uh, you and other have a sense of what happens when if many people follow you on on this route. Uh, for example, if the new index which you are developing is adopted by many other, or if the in general the financial innovation you are proposing are adopted by many other. So which type of uh, reaction should we expect both from the market viewpoint and from firms viewpoint? I'm not sure I heard if it's a question for me. It's, I, I don't hear. Well, it's a question well, for, for you and in general, uh, you know, for also for regulators and asset managers, what can we expect if the innovation you propose are adopted in a large scale? The new index that in you are proposing, for example, if it becomes the new reference index, can you expect changes in financial market? For example, now you have a, a premium. Can this premium still be there? Or can you expect some reaction from the firm viewpoint if capital is targeted oh, oh, in that way? Yes. Well, I, I hear many questions, if I'm correct. Uh, the first one is, um, here at Amundi, on the passive side, so the indexes, now 60%, 60 percent, six zero of our clients' requests uh, are integrating an ESG factor. So that's really a revolution because, you know, index was index point. And now <coughs> we have a merge between uh, the, uh, the passive world and the ESG world. And as passive is representing uh, massive amounts of money, that's clearly a pressure from uh, on corporates. The second part of the answer is a very interesting case with GPIF. You know, it's uh, the largest investor on earth. It's $1.6 trillion. The Japanese pensions, right? So, sorry? The, the Japanese, Japanese pensions, right? Japanese, so, okay. The Japanese public pension fund, absolutely. Um, and, and the CIO, Mr. Hiro Mizuno, um, is shifting the entire market. There's a very interesting case study written by Rebecca Henderson at Harvard on his leadership. And this gentleman has a very interesting um, point. He says, we are GPIF by owning $1.6 trillion. We are a universal owner. We own everything. And we do that through passive products. And he says, point one. Point two, my team has been working very hard for years to capture a fraction of 
performances. You know, when I get two or three bips, I'm very good, blah, 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 blah. And then he says, every 10 years, there's a financial crisis, and then it's, you know, the three or two or three bips that I've accumulated year after year, it's nothing compared to losing 30%. So actually, I'm very badly allocating my resources. So what I should do for the benefit of my pensioners, the Japanese citizens, is to have capital markets being more resilient. And so what he says now is that when he has a request from a, a firm that makes a bid on his passive products to engage with corporates. So he now says for 30% of, uh, of the results uh, on, on the tender offer, it will be about engagement of firms offering passive products with a corporate. And what is fascinating is that firms like Vanguard or, 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 or State Street that have always said, we don't want to know what the firms are doing. We are almost a, a middle office firm. Well, our job is to plug you know, a request from to execution. And now all these firms are facing the challenge to answer the question on how they engage with the corporates. So they are recruiting like crazy analysts to assess or to make the dialogue with the conference. And so suddenly you have one asset owner that is shifting the entire industry of passive products with a more um, a, an enhanced dialogue with the corporates and making the uh, capital markets more resilient. So what I'm trying to say here is that we have both more and more ESG factors integrating into passive products and we have as well some asset owners changing the, the rules of the games for the uh, passive industry. So it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's very serious. Hey, thank you. I want to go back with one question also to Laurent and uh, to Diana, but I see more from... Yeah. No. I just managed to find the answer to my question because... Uh, uh, Morgan Stanley, an analyst, recently published a report saying it would cost $50 trillion uh, between now and 2050 to, to solve the problem, basically. So that when I said a trillion a year, I wasn't that far off. Uh, a bit more, let's say $1.5 trillion. And so the question now for if, if all the private investment companies were to remove everything from fossil fuels and all the rest of it and divert everything into the into to solving that problem, would that be enough? Uh, or, you know, uh, uh, in other words, how much is left over for you know, central banks and other me methods? So you know, 1.5 trillion a year is, is the number. Thank you. Perhaps in uh, relationship with this, uh, this question, um, it is rational for investors to, um, well, to minimize the overall risk, and you all were talking about risk, uh, the green risk and the brown risk, yeah. even mispriced. So what I think is that um, it will be also always uh, rational to keep investments in brown risk, because the overall portfolio will be will have lower risk. So is there any solution? Have you any thoughts about how to overcome this, this uh, dilemma? That was the question that I wanted to ask to both Diana and to Laurent too. What about these assets that, you know, getting increasingly risky because of the energy transition, like uh, what we also refer to as stranded assets? Laurent, you were saying that uh, you know, one of the observations that you had as regulators that there is some climate risks that are underestimated, uh, right? And they're, they're linked to that. So uh, what is your experience with that, right? What is the real role of... of uh, asset managers in, in basically also disengaging or basically you know, changing the policies of, of really energy uh, intensive industries. And you know, also the question, like if you have 1.5 trillion a year to invest, if you can find that, uh, where can this money be put in? Can this be productively invested in the energy transition? I think um, from Bailey Gifford's perspective, we'd probably agree with Bill Gates. Uh, he talked about divestment actually not having any impact at all on reducing uh, emissions. 
When we invest, however, we're thinking about companies that can offer long-term sustainable growth. So for us, we're very unlikely to invest in the types of brown or olive types of companies that you see today. Um, I think, though, that all investors, whether or not you divest or you do invest, everybody has a role to engage with companies. Engage with them on that transition. Engage with them to invest to become cleaner. Engage with them to take a long-term and responsible approach to how they manage their business. So that's very much how we see our role at Bailey Gifford. We don't tend to divest, but those sorts of companies on the browner end of the scale don't necessarily meet the growth hurdles that we need as growth investors. Thank you. Laurent, you want to react? Uh, yes, so uh, with respect to, to some, of, some of the risks which are embedded in, in financial products or even uh, in the portfolio of the financial institution, part of our work is precisely to, to raise the awareness uh, of the banks and insurance companies in our case about uh, the risk they are facing. So you mentioned stranded assets, so they are full of, uh, full of assets which, which are exposed to this kind of risk. And that's part of the work that we have been uh, doing uh, with French uh, banks and insurance bank. Uh, I think it's very important because uh, you realize when you do that, that uh, there is a, at this stage uh, an imperfect uh, measurement of uh, climate change risk. Uh, and therefore, that's the reason for why we, we, we stress this risk. You, you stress also the role of uh, public institution and regulation. I think that, for instance, in the case of France, uh, there was this law on energy transition and one article, which is one art article uh, 173, which forced also financial institutions to better disclose their exposure vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, climate change risk. And this is also helping uh, investors to make their choice about uh, different uh, funding alternatives. Thank you. I'm looking at the audience that there is an... Marie, you have a question. Yeah, you, uh, can you wait for the mic micro? Thank you. Thank you. A quick question for, for Laurent. Um, you were referring to the debate uh, between central banks uh, in, in the use of green collateral. So could you elaborate a little bit on that and explain us wh what are the main arguments? So uh, who is for and who is against and what are the main arguments in this debate? Uh, I think it's very interesting. So I'm not going to name uh, central <laughs> banks, but uh, some, some central banks are willing really to take a step forward. So I can name one because it's public. Uh, for instance, the, the People China. Bank of China is already uh, using a form of uh, green supporting factor, if you wish, in, in, in the form of a lower air cut for banks which are financing uh, green projects. So this is not directly collateral policy. It's really a, a subsidy when you are providing refinancing to these banks. An alternative would be uh, to consider when you are providing liquidity to banks, um, favoring uh, those which have uh, lateral, which is greener to some extent, uh, with respect to uh, those who has uh, some form of collateral, which is uh, brown to some extent, because I, I say to some extent, because at this stage we, do, we don't know how precisely to define the color. But uh, these are the kind of uh, issues that, that are discussed in the context of central banks. Thank you. I'm looking whether there is another contribution time is up so it would have to be really important so then I would like to conclude I, and thank everyone especially our three panelists for joining us thank you Frederick Simama thank you Laurent Claire and thank you Diana Philip for joining us for this uh, panel on green investment that shows that there is engagement right both from the private asset managers and from the public regulators on this topic 
And a question to uh, the organizer, is there coffee waiting for us? Or is there is a coffee outside in the, in the room where we had lunch. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>